<laughs> Meanwhile, Howard, flying all over the country to represent mayors and CEOs and other big deals smart enough to hire him, uh, found acting. He then turned to a TV series called K Street that appeared on HBO, where he played himself. And in the movie Fame, he was a butcher. Uh, he was involved in politics after that, where he became a confidant to governors and senators, uh, worked on the Bush versus Gore case. So while Howard hobnobbed with uh, Senator Warner and Vice President Gore and George Clooney and Ben Affleck, uh, I practiced law in Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> then one day in 2007, uh, Howard called me up and said, I just met the next president of the United States. And I said, who? And he told me about this fellow named Barack Obama. Howard then became a very successful fundraiser and friend uh, of the president. That led to a very successful four-year term as ambassador, uh, and that led to his current role as a consultant to many Belgian co companies and com companies all over the world. Um, so that's Howard. But all that really pales in comparison to what I can say best about Howard, uh, and that is uh, that he and his wife Michelle, who's here today with us, are the best friends uh, that anyone could ever ask for and the best aunt and uncle that my kids have. So uh, with that, let me introduce my, my best friend, Howard Gunn. There's really absolutely no reason for me to say any further. I just sit down and clip on the head. Um, I have always admired for 40 years the absolute honesty of Larry Villardo until today. <laughs> but I will take that on the road with me wherever I go. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and let me say, um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, in Buffalo for many, many reasons. It's a relief to be here in Buffalo for many reasons. Uh, obviously, to be with this distinguished panel is fabulous, uh, to get to meet many of you. But the truth is that it's mainly fabulous to have an excuse to come up to Buffalo to see our oldest and dearest friends, Larry and Jeannie, and the family, and particularly now, particularly the joy yesterday when we got to meet the newest Villardo, Charles Lawrence Lyons. Judge Villardo and Jeannie's uh, first grandson, a one-month-old grandson, uh, and that couldn't have been a bigger thrill. And I have to tell you, one-month-old baby Charlie is a remarkably brilliant baby. <laughs> <laughs> because when I picked this baby up yesterday and held him like this, he whispered in my ear, well, Merrick Garland is a fine pick for the U.S. Supreme Court, but don't you think the Scalia seat should stay with an Italian-American and that Buffalo is ready for its next U.S. Supreme Court? <laughs> now, it's a relief to be here in all seriousness because I have been thinking about these issues for a very long time. And in honesty, I have never fully come to grips with them and never come to peace with them. Uh, but it will help, it will help me, uh, and hopefully uh, Ed will like to some, to discuss them together. And you see, for 20,530 days of my life, I believed to my core in the law. I believed in its power, its majesty, but mainly its wisdom. I believed in the law as having rational judgment, even with the hardest questions, when the heat was really up. I believed in priests and rabbis, but they could falter. Philosophers could wring their hands, and they still wouldn't come right. But to me, it could be Felix Frankfurter, or Alva Wendell Holmes, or all of us in this room who've dedicated to the law, who believe in the law, that we knew if we carried the torch right, we would come up with the right answers. And that's the reason I went to college and then to law school. And where I got to uh, clerk for this man, the older man in the middle, let me say what you the pointer there, uh, Judge Irving Goldberg on the Fifth Circuit, uh, who taught me that law isn't just in the mind, it's also in the heart. And it was there that I developed my lifelong friendship with my co-clerk, um, the newest uh, judge in the Western District of New York, who exhibits all the time the wisdom of both the heart and the mind. And it was that abiding belief that I had in the law that then propelled me next uh, to clerk for Justice Potter Stewart, who taught me that law need never bend to economic might or to political status. It was the same reverence that led me to become a special assistant to the director of the FBI, who was an Eighth Circuit former judge, and taught me what, what crime and law enforcement mean when it's applied through the law. 
And it's the reason I chose Ruth Bader Ginsburg to swear me in when I became the U.S. Ambassador to Belgium. And it's what I took with me to Belgium, and it was the abiding belief in the law that I brought with me when I was asked to brief the President one-on-one -on -one in the Oval Office. It served me so well for 20,530 days until I saw that house. There I am standing in front of it, and when I saw that house, it began to shake. That's a picture of that house in 2012. On the far left is a picture of that house in 1946. And another picture of the house, the smaller one on the left, in 1984. That was the house that shook my belief that law could provide all the answers. I realized then that the law could not answer for me Whose house is that anyway? Whose house is that today? And as I looked down the block, just a little further from where that house is, was that green building at the end, a green store. And I realized for the first time in my life that the law could not answer for me any longer, who does that store belong to? When we took the short walk away, there we are again, and I realized for the first time that the law could not tell me whether that building is a hardware store or a mikvah. A mikvah is a religious bath building used by Orthodox Jews in ceremonial uh, occasions. I realized that Frankfurter or Holmes or Villardo or Stewart or Goldberg, or none of us in the room could answer those questions for me anymore. And then I learned that the law could not even identify for me what's an act of theft versus an act of bravery. And even worse, I realized it could not answer for me anymore whether suffocating a young Jewish woman to death in the woods of Poland was an act of murder or of heroism. Indeed, I realized that the law had failed when I learned the full story of the life of Gibman Mogulnitsky. So clearly we were getting ahead of ourselves. Let me try to be a little clearer. Let's start from the beginning. That's a picture of the town of Bialorowska, Poland in the 1930s. There's a picture of Bialorowska, Poland, today, in 2012, the same picture from the 1930s. Bialorowska, Poland, then, in, um, in 2012, and back in the 1930s, was a peaceful, prototypical Polish town. 3,000 citizens. In the 1930s, it was about a day's uh, travel south of Warsaw. By travel in uh, 2012, it was two hours south of Warsaw. In both times, it had 3,000 residents. In the 1930s, there was 1,300 Jews and 1,700 non-Jews. And in the 1930s, in that house, and now the, the house, that house today, and that house in 1946, lived Gidel Mogulnitsky. Her second husband, her first husband had died, and several of her teenage children. And just down the block from that house where Gidel lived, so it was the green store at the, at the end. It wasn't green at the time. And that was Giddle's general store. She owned the general store for the town of Bialorowska. Uh, she was beloved by Jews and Catholics in Poland alike uh, because she always dealt in credit. Sometimes they were farmers. She'd pay when the crops came in. Uh, and they lived in total peace and happiness. But by 1939, Hitler had invaded Poland and Bialorowska, Poland, like most classic uh, small Polish towns had turned dark. Gido Mogulnitsky, her family, and the rest of the 1,300 Jews had been rounded up into one corner of the, of the town into what became the Jewish ghetto. Now, by 1942, three years later, the heat was really turning on. So Gido's oldest son, Gitman Mogulnitsky, and a few of his friends snuck out of Bialorowska, Poland, with the idea to join the resistance. And they met up with resistance. They had gold teeth. They looked like your classic Jews. The resistance said it would never work. They could not become part of the underground, and they should go back and protect their families. So Gibbon Mogulnitsky and the few friends who had left Bialorowska headed back to Bialorowska, but they never got back to the town. They met some others in the woods, and they saw from the hillside and from the woods that while they were away, the Germans had come to the town. The ghetto was gone. The town that they knew was no more. They found a few other stragglers in the woods, and there was no place to go, so 13 of them, the small band of 13 who had made it out of Bialorowska, Poland, Gibman Mogulnitsky, his younger sister, Hudis Mogulnitsky, 
and 11 of their other friends from the town had no choice but to hide in these woods. The woods, there's now the memorial, at the time it's just woods. Those woods outside the Alarovska Poland, the 13 in the woods, while the 1200 and other, 1,287 others, their parents, their siblings, their friends, had not gotten out. And Gibbon Mogilnitsky and the 12 others uh, hidden those woods for 27 months, including three winters. 27 months, three winters outside in a climate that is almost identical to the climate of Buffalo, New York. Uh, they swept at night by digging out grave sites because the Germans would come along from time to time at night and shoot along the ground to hit anyone sweeping on the ground. So they'd sweep below the ground. And then how did they uh, exist? How did they eat? What did they do? Well, the woods provided some, but if you take a look at that, it's not providing a lot. Early on, uh, some of the Poles, their dear neighbors, would leave food uh, in the back, would leave food uh, and trash that, that was obviously not trash, um, hoping they wouldn't get caught. That became fewer and, and far between. So most often, the band of 12, of 13, relied on the oldest, Gipman Mogonitsky, to sneak back into town at night to steal chickens and whatever else he could steal from the people who had been the lifelong customers of his family's general store. So for 27 months, Gibbon stole what he could to keep them alive. And finally, in 1945, after 27 months in the woods, the Russians liberated Poland, the Russians liberated Yalorovska, and the Russians liberated the band then residing in the woods. At the time, 11 of the original 13 remained. One had died of sickness, being in the elements, had died uh, being sick and had passed away uh, during the winters. And the 13th of the band, Gibman's younger sister, Hootis. Uh, well, about her, the 11 surviving ones spoke thereafter about Hootis and her death only in whispers and in vague references. Never aloud and never in clear sentences. So the truth is less than certain. It's not quite uh, uh, certain what it is, but the whispers and the vague references seem to suggest that living and hiding in the woods for 27 months, being hunted every day, was more than Hootis could take and her psyche could take. So she began over time to become less rational, to begin to lose it, to become more uncontrolled. She wanted it to end, to be caught, to be put out of her misery, just to have it over. So from time to time, as the remaining 12, one had died of natural causes, as the remaining 12 were still hiding in the woods, who just thought she'd hear the Germans nearby so she would begin to cry out? Or on one or two occasions she'd begin to run into the open and the other 12 had to stop her. And at those times, the group's leader, Hudis' older brother, Gibman, was the main one to do it. And one time, Hudis began to yell out and Gibman and perhaps some of the others had to restrain her to keep all of them safe. And so as he did, as they muzzled, as they did all that they could to silence her, to restrain her, keeping the, the screams that would cause all of them to be put to an imminent death. As Gibbon and perhaps the others did what they could so that they could see it tomorrow, who just stopped moving? She stopped struggling. She had not passed out. She was gone. Now when the Russians liberated them, 10 of them, not Gibbon, but the other 10, they made their way to Lutz, Poland. Most of them stayed in Lutz a few months, some a few years, until they went to the countries that willingly took the Jews from the war. They went to Canada, they went to Australia, they went to Israel and even the UK. But they didn't come to the US because the US had quotas. The Jews could not freely come to the US. So the others scattered, they went to Lutz, they got to Germany, they got to Australia, they went to Canada, they went to the UK. They developed new lives, they married. In fact, two of the 10 married each other and they developed new lives, they had their children scattered around the world. And the secrets of Bialorovska Poland, of chickens in the night, of, of deaths in the woods, that stayed with them, their new wives, and their children. But the last one, Gitman Mogulnitsky, after being liberated by the Russians in the woods, he went back to Bialorovska. He went back to that house. And he knocked on the door and he said, excuse me, this house belongs to Gidel Moganitsky 
and my family, this is my house. And the Poles who had moved in when the Jews went to the ghetto, obviously called the Polish police. So Gibbon Mogulnitsky spent his first night of freedom after 27 months in the Polish woods, sitting in a Polish jail. Uh, until the next day when the Russians came by and liberated the jails as well. So with nothing left in Bialorowska, Gibbon went after the war first to Warsaw and then to Berlin looking for two things. Survivors from the town of 1300, what happened to the other 1287, and perhaps employment for a Jew either in Poland or in Germany. But you couldn't find any between 1945 and, and 1950. They realized then, and they confirmed subsequently, that had any of the 1,287 others survived, surely some would have survived the camps. Roughly 5% of the Jews who went to the camps had survived the camps, so do the math out of 1,287. But we heard it before, um, those in Bialorowska had never made it to the camps. In fact, after marching uh, the Jews to the rail cars, the rail cars were lined with lye, uh, they never took a single step in the track in the 1287. Uh, the Jewish community of Bialorowska had been wiped out without the trains ever leaving the station. So finding neither survivors nor employment, Gibbon thought about joining the others in Lutz or maybe Canada or the UK or Australia or Israel where the Jews went. But instead he believed in the land of opportunity, wanted to go to the United States, America. Had a little problem of quotas, but he was a kind of clever fellow. He took all of his savings he could put together, and he bought a phony passport. Uh, a passport from what was then an independent state, a free country called Danzig. Today it's Gdansk, Poland. But at the time it was Danzig, and he had a phony passport. And now, he's, since he was from Gdansk, since he was from uh, Danzig, he was allowed in. There were no quotas. Uh, and really quite a seemingly not so creative guy, Gibbon Mogulnitsky. Uh, reversed his names, so he became Mogulnitsky Gitman, um, which he then said, that doesn't really sound like that's going to go well in America, so he picked Moshe Gitman. Great choice. Uh, and when he landed in Ellis Island, uh, the intake people said, Moshe doesn't work here, you're now Max, and by the way, we pronounce uh, G-U-T-M-A-N, not Gitman, but Gutman. So Gitman Mogulnitsky of Yalorovska, Poland, became Max Gutman of the Bronx, New York and of the Garment Center in the Lower East Side. Gitman, or then Max, as he was known, um, married, two, uh, married uh, in two years later in 1950, had a daughter in 1952, uh, and a daughter in 1954, and a son in 1956. But unlike the other 10 who survived when they had gotten remarried and had their children, Gitman never spoke about Bialorowski, provided scant few details to his new wife, and never once to his children. Never once a story about a town or a general store or about woods or about chickens and certainly never about an aunt named Hootis. Indeed, the children never learned their real last name. But such a burden, such a past never melts away fully. There was always something there. So somewhere, whether it was Gibman or Max in 1973, under circumstances as vague, but as dark and as ill-colored as the death of Hootis 28 later, 28 years earlier, Gitman or Max died alone in the hotel room, leaving an 18-year-old, didn't plan that part, and a 16-year-old son. Now, with no idea of the torment that his father had lived through, that son went to Columbia and Harvard Law School, and the Fifth Circuit clerkship, and the Supreme Court clerkship, and the friendship with the Villardos, and a 27-year legal career, and became named ambassador to Belgium in 2009. And while the children of the other 10 survivors stayed in touch, they didn't really know fully what had happened to Gitman. They knew that he got remarried in America. And then the most amazing thing happened. The strangest thing happened. While winning an award for service to the Jewish community in Europe, that ambassador made a speech in Belgium on anti-Semitism, a speech that got misquoted by a journalist and turned into political fodder in the United States. So as eight Republican candidates for president, two Catholics, two Mormons, two evangelical Christians, called for my firing as an anti-Semite, um, word of that story went viral on the internet. 
being accused of an anti-Semite, the son of a Holocaust survivor who had just won an award for service to the Jewish community in Europe. And the interesting part, because that story went viral, the grown children of the other 10 survivors realized that Gibbon Mogilnitsky's son was now a U.S. ambassador in Europe. And they got in touch. And they said that the group, the other 10, their offspring, now 20 or so, were meeting from Australia and from Canada and from the UK, and they were going to Bialorovska, Poland for the 70th anniversary of the liquidation of the Jewish ghetto. Uh, now, for years as ambassador in Belgium, I had attended dozens of different Holocaust commemorations in Belgium uh, with German ambassadors at all of them. And I had, we had, Michelle and I had visited Germany often. And we had long learned that Germany had fully accepted and made peace with its past and had moved on to build its future. When the sky is blue in Germany today, the sun shines through brightly. Um, and when we got together and met the, the children of the other 10 survivors, slowly we heard stories of Gibbon Mogulnitsky and the stories of being the leader and the stories of keep getting the food to keep them alive and of the chickens and even the whispers and unclear references about Hootis. When we got to Poland also for our first visit, we got to Białorowska, still a town. There it is today, still a town of 3,000 people but no Jews. We learned that unlike modern Germany, the shadow was still there. It still hung over the town. When the sun shines in, in uh, Europe today, there's still a shadow in Białorowska. And as I looked at this house, and I stared at that house, the house of Gidon Mogulnitsky, the house where Gidon Mogulnitsky had grown up, I felt absolutely no claim of ownership to this foreign cabin. I just wanted to see where my father had grown up. But the owner stayed inside and didn't let us in. And that happened in building after building with several other landowners not agreeing to let us in because they feared that this foreign group had come back 70 years later to claim their cabins. And the mayor of Yalorovska could not meet with the delegation. It seems that the U.S. Jewish restitution organizations were still fighting with the town over this hardware store on one side and there's a little fire department on the other, claiming that it's a mitzvah. And because of that, the mayor couldn't come and meet with our delegation. And yet the reception for our delegation was glorious. So many came out to meet us, and the local community group performed a play for the town and for the visiting delegation from around these different countries of these 20-something survivors of the 10 survivors, so offspring of the survivors. The town performed a play in Yiddish. And it was the first time Yiddish had been spoken in Bialrovska, Poland, in 70 years. And at the nighttime banquet for the delegation, the deputy mayor got up to greet us. The mayor couldn't be there, but the deputy mayor got there, uh, got up at the bank, banquet. And he welcomed us, all these visitors from around the world, these 20, 20 uh, professionals from around the world, from Canada, from the US, from the UK, from Belgium, and then he said, it was the most important day in the history of Bialorovska. Because in the history of Bialorovska, there had never been a visit by a United States ambassador. And there it was. One generation, 70 years after Shipman Molinitsky spent 27 months hiding in their woods, after he had stolen their chickens, chickens that they had bought from the general store, after Hudis had been suffocated, after he spent one night in jail trying to reclaim his home, the visit of Gibman Mogulnitsky's son, a Jewish American, to Bialrovska in 2012 became the most important day in the town's history. So then when I stared back at that house, I finally understood the answer to the question, whose house is it anyway? 
And I, as I stared at the corner store, in green, that had been my grandmother's, I finally understood the answer to whose store is it anyway? To the question of whether, of whether this building was a mikvah or a hardware store. I understood the answer to the question of whether my father was truly brave or a thief. And I even understood the question as to whether he was a hero or had murdered a man, an aunt I never got to know. I knew that the answer then was that although we can never, never forget, for to forget is to risk that the horror of the past could be visited on us again. I knew that although we could never forget, the answer to those questions was, it doesn't matter. Don't bother worrying about the ownership of a ramshackle house. Don't bother worrying whether structures of bricks and mortars from um, a, a lifetime away that can still erect blockades to a better future. Don't worry about what happened to chickens that were actually the victims of others' horrors. Don't even worry about the culpability for suffocating of a woman in the woods of Poland for those who were actually killed by atrocities by others. You see, to me, the law falters when faced with the hardest of questions at the most important times because it looks backwards. It obsesses on correcting the past. It obsesses on understanding the past, on righting the wrongs, and on evening the scores. But sometimes, at some point, with some horrors, with some pains, it's no longer about evening the score or correcting the past. It's about building the better future. It's about listening to a Yiddish play in Bial Raska. It's about the time that the visit of a Jewish American becomes the most important event in the town's history. So although the historians will always matter, because we should never forget, it's not the lawyers, it's the diplomats, it's the architects of tomorrow, it's venture capitalists, it's engineers. It's those who look to tomorrow and those of their ilk who have the only answers that actually matter. And it's about coming to Buffalo and sharing thoughts with others about both yesterday and the tomorrow of our planet. Thanks so much.